Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian thought leaders, influencers, and business owners in a realm where there's really no compromise inside of faith and inside of business, where you go from a good business to building a God business where he multiplies your success. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, go ahead and hit it right now. You're going to want to. Also, ring that bell if you're on your YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast version, go ahead and subscribe rate and review if this is something that's brought value into your life. This episode is absolutely phenomenal. One of the weirdest things happened was inside the conversation, this guy had talked about how he was tithing off of the income that he wanted to actually make. So we started tithing that and you'll see what happens. Was it detrimental or was it something that was actually beneficial to him? He breaks down what he means by that as well. He also broke down a lot of things with his encounters with God, the business that he was able to create. And this guy has created a phenomenal business, not only a, an insane recording studio, but has actually became a very prevalent business coach where he actually has a book called How to Get Paid for What You Know. And he's been teaching people how to monetize their expertise the exact same way that he's been doing it. Welcome, my friend, Graham Cochran. Graham, what's up, dude? Welcome to the God's Business Podcast. Oh, man, I'm so glad to be on a podcast called God's Business. So I'm, I'm pumped for this. That actually might be a good place to start is like, what does that feel like even? I know that being in the business world, it's like, how often do you really get to just like fully open up about the faith side of your life? So why does it make you excited being on a podcast like God's Business? Well, be, yeah, it's a great question because I, I didn't grow up around entrepreneurs at all and I didn't expect to be one. And then when I became one, um, it was very much God sort of shoving me into entrepreneurship. So it wasn't even my idea. But when I became one, I realized just how lonely it is to be a Christian entrepreneur. I had Christian friends and then I had to go find entrepreneur friends, but they didn't share my worldview. They weren't Christians. And so it was hard to get counsel. It was hard to ask questions that I needed so many more layers of context around them because there's ways to make money and but there's there's God's ways of doing things as well so I have felt like I've come out of a season of over a decade of like I'm the only Christian entrepreneur I know and then I met some but they're very brick and mortar and they don't understand what I'm doing online so just praising God for like all the connections he's making in my world in the last 12 to 18 months. And then you're one of them too, joining the Wellspring, connecting with you. And then the, I love that there's podcasts like this that exist because I think there's, this is the next wave of serving the planet and, and reaching people for Jesus, I think is through business owners who are believers. Uh, and the more we can connect and talk and help each other, the better. You're literally like preaching my message, dude. I'm like, I, I need to clip that. We need to put it everywhere. Cause th really that was the heart behind it is that I came from ministry as well and coming into business, it was like everyone who was a Christian that was in business, like was already retired, kind of passed that. And I was like, Hey, like, I kind of need to know, like, if I'm deploying this hundred K into Facebook ads, like what buttons do I click? And like, what do I do? And, and though there was wisdom, there wasn't that like craft, like the actual tactical side of it. And so for you, like when, when did you actually get started? really looking into the business stuff. I know you didn't come from that background. What year was it that you really dove into entrepreneurship? Yeah, 2009, um, my wife and I moved to Tampa, Florida. We were in Virginia before we moved to Florida to help some friends plant a church. And we were all like volunteers. So we were ministering to college students. And um, so I was like the worship guy, but it was just like this, the weekend gig, you know, there's no money. So we all had to go get jobs. I, it, this was during the Great Recession. So it was hard to get a job. Uh, nobody was hiring. Everyone was like just holding on to their money. So I finally, after <laughs> like 50 interviews, got a job, uh, rant, just I'll take anything kind of deal. And we moved, uh, built our, our, bought our first house, I should say, had our first baby. Uh, and then, f you know, two months later, I lost that job because they ran out of money. It was a startup and it just was doomed from the start. And so they had to let me go. So here we are, new city, church planning, 2009. And baby and a mortgage and I'm 26 years old and I'm like, I, I literally don't know what I'm doing. And it was in that season where I felt God say, I don't want you to go back and get a job. I want you to do something different. And, uh, and I thought it was going to be freelance. That would be the, maybe the angle. Cause I had a background in music recording and production for bands. And so I had, I had client work, but it was just the side gig for fun and extra money. I, I never had the guts to go all in on that as a thing. So I thought maybe God was calling me into that, but he used that idea 
to get me into what I'm doing now, which is content, online business, courses, coaching. Yeah. So, but it was really 2009 of like, what's happening in my life? A lot of uncertainty, starting new things that don't make any sense and watching God do something really, really cool. Yeah, what an example. I think about even when I was first carpet cleaning before I ever really started my own business or I'd failed one, started carpet cleaning. I was making like 20K a year. I'm sure at 26, you may have been making a little bit more than that. But you know, I think I saw a blog post of you guys like generating like 170K a month or something like that of personal income. And, and you think about that and it's like birthed out of this really negative place. And I think that mm. oftentimes as humans, we have this sh very small view of like what's going on right now in front of us. And it feels like it's going to kill us. We had this mutual friend named Adele uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's in the Wellspring as well. And this guy had a billion dollar valuation company got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, had his whole company embezzled, had to claim bankruptcy, and he got asked a really crazy question, which was, if you could go back and someone would give you $10 billion, but you couldn't go through all those heartaches, would you take it? And you would think, bro, like, even, even me, bro, I'd be like, $10 million, not have to have pancreatic cancer, all these different problems, embezzlement, best friends, like, kind of screw you over. And he said, no, and I'm looking at yours, and I'm like, man, I bet at the time that really mm. felt like like why have you forsaken me style yeah. moment, right? And I think a lot of people go through those. What did that feel like at the time, just in that moment going back? Did it feel like, oh, the darkest is before the dawn. I'm going to be a successful guy one day. Or did it feel like I'm going to die? I have a baby and a, and a wife named Shay. And mm -hmm. now you have two two kids, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two girls. But at the time, one girl. Yeah. And you're like, in this moment, take me through that. Yeah, it was not. It was not darkness before the dawn. Um, it was because I, you're right. There's those two types of entrepreneurs. There's the one who knows what's possible, has seen other people do it. Maybe they've gotten the mentorship. Maybe they understand the business model, and they're just standing at the foot of the mountain. And they're like, "Okay, it's going to be hard, but I know how to get to the top because either someone's taught me, or I've been educated, or I have a mentor along the way. But it's going to be hard." And, and that's what you're convincing yourself as of. It's going to be worth it when we get there. And then there's the people like me who had no clue what was possible and wasn't trying to scale a mountain. I was, I was very happy making a, I mean, I wasn't happy, happy because I wasn't doing the work I was called to do. I mean, I wanted to be a rock star and that dream died as a 22 year old. And then I'm just like doing jobs. So I wasn't happy in my jobs, but I was very safe. Right. Until I, until I wasn't, you're safe with your job until you're not as a lot of people are finding out. But for me, it was, it was panic. Um, it was, I had dealt with a lot of shame of like, how can I, I'm not providing, um, there was a lot of sh guilt and shame coming, not explicitly, but implicitly from my Christian community. Like, w when are you going to go get a job, like a real job and provide for Shay? And what's your plan? Family members just genuinely who love me. What is your plan? What, why are you blogging about audio recording? Like, what's the plan there? You know, it was very like a lot of shame and guilt because I had no idea what I was even doing was even a business model. Like I wasn't, there was no Amy Porterfield teaching me. I didn't know who Jeff Walker was. I wasn't, I, I was literally in the dark. Like, can, can I make money somehow? So I was very scared, very uncertain. Um, it was weird because people sometimes ask me, why did you keep doing it then? And there was only two reasons. One was I, I could sense that something, there was something valuable about what I was doing. And if you do any kind of content online, you know, like you don't need very many people to get a sense that what you're putting out in the world is resonating on a way that like, man, this is helping people. I didn't know how to monetize it, but I, I felt like I was genuinely helping people and there was something valuable there. So that kept me going. And then two, my wife, Shay, you would think she would be like, when are you going to go get a job? But she had a sense that there was something there as well, as scared as she was. So I think if she had said, like, you got to go to get a job, I probably would have because I was too scared. But she was like, I think you should keep doing what you're doing. Um, but it was dark, bro. It was it was like stumbling, like literally, like I don't have a plan. I wish I had a map, but I didn't have a map. It kind of reminds me of the verse, like he's the light to our path, but also the lamp to our feet. And a lot of people like bunch that together. And I had a mentor of mine talk about how like sometimes those are different seasons. You know, like right now with building King's mm. Brotherhood or even this podcast, I know the path. I know the light to my path. I can see where we're going. I know we're going to get there. I know the path to get there. I see it clearly. But for the last seven years, a lot of it has been 
kind of just him being a lamp to my feet. You know, like mm-hmm. you talked about looking up the mountain. You're like, I know it's going to be really hard, but I know the path to get there. Like, I know it's going to be tough to climb Everest, but there's like base camp. And mm-hmm. as long as you make it to the next checkpoint, like you're good. There's other times where you're like, bro, I have no clue what's in front of me right now. But like, I'm going to just take one step forward. And one of the things that I, I want to go back to um, before I want to kind of go a little bit further back, but I want to kind of put a pin in this place of your you and your wife. Because I think that's a very interesting dynamic that when we talk about God's business, one of the biggest things is like not just doing God's work or, or being a business person in the marketplace that loves Jesus, but it's also around how it shapes the decisions that we make. A lot mm. of times people will look at your guys' lives and be like, yo, look at their relationship. She was so supportive. I want to be supportive too. So they try to take the outcome, the 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 reaction, right? Like Christ says now that that no longer is the law written on stone, but now it's written on your heart. Mm-hmm. And so because it's written on your heart, you now have this 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 external thing that you do. You now react a certain way. And if people try to copy the reactions, they're literally mm-hmm. just trying to like live under the law that doesn't work. And so mm-hmm. it's important for people to see that it's Christ's power through you guys. It's her vision to see a godly vision that gave her the support and the ability to support. Not just go support. It was like, no, connect with Jesus, have a relationship with him. And then out of that is how you gain the vision and the understanding to do those things. I want to go back there and, and hear what that was really about. For you, you said 26 was right around this point. 22, you failed a career. Walk, walk me through that. You go through high school. What kind of family did you grow up in? And, and tell me about that dream that you had because I think it's interesting to hear just what are the building blocks because God mm. will often use – these seemingly insignificant years, and it seems like he has, to mm. build the next thing. Walk me through that journey. Yeah, and I'm still I'm still unpacking some of those connections that God's making from my past. So I grew up um, in a, a non-Christian home, I would say, but a, a, a church-going home. Um, so we had sort of a religious upbringing. I believed in God. We went to church every Sunday, but Jesus wasn't really preached. And then we all kind of got saved probably when I was in high school. God used a variety of means for us to actually like understand who Jesus was. And uh, I, God used, uh, um, um, why am I blanking? Uh, young life. He's young life to, to bring me to a point where I actually heard a gospel presentation. Like that's all it took. Like I just had never heard the gospel in church my whole life. Never heard. So So sad. So that was powerful. Um, And then no discipleship, though, after that. Like, I still didn't know how to read my Bible or walk with Jesus, so I kind of floundered until uh, post-college. But in that home, uh, I I fell in love with music. My dad's a musician, um, and early on as a kid, like, people like, oh, you can sing. And so I was like, oh, that's cool, and I like singing. So I was the little kid in, like, all the little performances in school. Um, I got into the, the, the band, like, the playing trumpet, like, traditional band kind of thing. And I learned how to read music and I was like, that's cool, but I want to sing and I want to like be famous and be a, like a rock star. So I taught myself guitar. And so there was like, and, and every step I took in music, there was a lot of outside affirmation of you're talented at this. You should do this. We support you in this. And so, you know, when you have a dream and then others see it in you as well, that gives you a little bit of fuel to like, maybe there's something here. And I had no other interests. You know, I didn't want a job which clued to me and probably if I had known someone could have said, Hey, you, you also could have been an entrepreneur. You know, it's not just a musician. There's, you know, there's, you're the kind of person that doesn't want to sit at a desk. That doesn't mean you have to be this creative entrepreneur or this musician, but entrepreneurs are the same type of person. They don't want to sit at a desk either. They want to go create something in the world and have the applause of their income and their clients and their customers. It's very similar. It's interesting. If you look at the two, a, a musician and a performer and an entrepreneur, but I didn't know about that because I didn't know any business owners, but I knew I, I wanted to do something in front of a ton of people. I loved being on the stage. I was a theater kid. I either wanted to be an actor or a musician, but famous, that's all I wanted to be. And I wanted to be on the stage in front of people where there was energy, get that applause, get that immediate reaction, total classic introvert, but loves to extrovert and lives for delivering something powerful that impacts people. What was like one of the most epic parts of that? Did you have one of those breakout moments where you're like, I'm literally living it. Like, did you get on the stages? Did you get in front of the people? Did you get the opportunity to perform the way you wanted to? I got, I got variations of it. So like 
I got to, I mean, I nerded out like I was in all male acapella group, like in college, you know, like a glorified boy band. Like I did that and got like all these solos and we would do regional tours and we would do stuff and be on stage with tons of tons of people doing that. I played in a rock band where we would do all the bars and stuff and most of them were awful. And then so we had some good moments, but it nothing ever broke through for me in a way that was the way my dream was intended. And then I felt like it was all moving to a point of getting a record deal. I had finally had a mentor who had been on a bunch of labels, toured with Elton John and a bunch of people and was like, look, I, I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to use all my connections. And we kind of did the whole get a producer from Nashville, get a band together, make a record, shop it to labels. And it was happening as I was finishing college and I was engaged to Shay because we met really young. So I knew I wanted to get married right out of college and I needed to provide. So I was like, hey, this could all work. I could get a deal, get some money, have a career, get married. And th then nobody really came calling with any real deal. They were all just called development deals, right? Where, hey, we'll sign you, but you still got to go do it on your own. And in, when we see it working a little bit, then we'll put money behind it. There was no advance. There was no promise of any upfront money. And I was like, I need, I need money. I can't. I'm not single really anymore. Like I'm getting married. So nothing was happening. And that was sort of when the dream kind of died where all of like my childhood and now I'm 22 and I'm graduating. And I'm like, Oh crap, I'm going to have to go get a job like next month. Like, what what was that like? Cause I, I remember even for myself, my wife and I came out of ministry. I, we ended up starting in network marketing, our first business yet. I actually ended up taking those funds and going after a dream that I had. And I was about 20, 21 and I want to be a professional motocross racer my whole life. So I start going back after it like four days a week training relentlessly and that whole company failed. And I remember this one point where I like rode my last time and facing my reality, my wife and I got kicked out of our town home. We moved into a 400 square foot apartment after living at my father's for 30 days. I was so broke at this point. Mm -hmm. I had driven us into debt. I was literally like, there was times where I had to drive my truck to the motocross track and take the gas from my motorcycle and put it into yep. the truck to wow. try to get home. And I remember sitting there one time after we had like been evicted from our place, denied to live in a new place, and I knew it was like, man, this is very difficult, but I'm going to have to give up this thing right now to go after this thing. But I remember at the mm. time it was like, what a negative situation, right? Like I'm giving up on my dream and – I'm walking into a very jacked up environment where I've neglected this whole area of my life for the pursuit of this dream in my heart that I thought was God's as well. I cry about it, dreaming about it. And I just like, that was a very difficult thing for you. When was that head of like, man, technically in this, in this you know perspective, I've completely freaking failed, fell on my face. And now I'm going to have to just give up on this. Like, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I was angry at God. Um, I was confused because, like, to maybe to your point, like your your dream, like it felt like this is makes sense. This is this is what I'm gifted at. This is what people are saying I should do. This is what like lights me up. Um, I'm taking every opportunity that God's given me and trying to be faithful with it and do my part. Why would God give me a dream and then seemingly take it away? Um, and I. I have a high value of doing the right thing. And so I deferred to like, well, I'm, I'm a husband now. So I'm, I'm, or, you know, I'm engaged to be married. So I'm going to just focus on the right thing, which is getting some stability, getting a job. Um, and, and Shay's awesome. She was like, I, I don't need you to, to make a ton of money. Like we'll just live a life. And so I focused on that. Uh, and then to the long story short, I mean, I think this is an interesting discussion because all of us have these dreams, but maybe we, maybe we don't fully know, what it is the dream is that we have a, a, an idea, right? Like Paul talks about in the scriptures, like I, we see sort of dimly in a mirror, but when, when we're finally with Jesus, we'll see fully, like we kind of have an idea of what it is and, and maybe we're just taking our best steps and guesses towards it. But I know that my dream of, of performing, of impacting people, um, th there was something even bigger than that, like bigger than me singing or writing songs or playing on stage is like, he's, he had millions of people in, in mind that I could impact, but it was through a, a thing I never would have thought of or even knew existed through YouTube and blog posts and email. And, you know, I've been doing online business for 14 years. And it's like the people that I've impacted is way more than I could have as a musician. And I'm getting to use so many of my random skills, uh, you know, audio production, you know, c c communication, like, uh, 
performance, like all this stuff. And then I uncovered new skills I didn't know I had, like teaching. Turns out I'm a really good teacher in terms of taking complex subjects and making them simple and helping people feel empowered that they can go do it themselves. I've done it in the music space and now in the business space. I would never have known. And then full circle moment, God in the last couple of years gave me a new vision, which I think is like the updated version of the original vision, which is to be a speaker on stages. So like I literally had a vision that God gave me. I'm on a stage. There's five to 10,000 people in front of me, but not as a singer, but as, as a speaker, bringing life, using my voice in a different way um, and impacting people. So it's not even, even confined to my online business. I feel, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out because I'm at the beginning of that journey but I, I sense God saying you, you are going to be on stages again and you are going to continue to impact people, but it'll be through speaking and teaching and not through music necessarily. Dude, so good. And even looking at your journey, I think this is so big for looking at how faith can multiply. Like for us, it's all about no compromise. I look at health, relationships, business, and there's many business communities. And I, I run one just for Christian men. And inside of that, I've let them know that it's not about – when you follow God, now you have this like other priority that you now have to give to, and all these areas kind of diminish. You can't be as good at business because you need to mm -hmm. take care of your faith. You need you can't be as good as, as a family man, or you have to be a family man now because that's what a man of faith would do. It's that when you submit yourself to God, the works that you submit before him now get multiplied by him as well. Mm -hmm. It'd be like the concept of giving, right? The, the yep. concept even in tithing that's taught is like, hey – you could probably do a lot more if you have access to God's economy by giving him 10% so he helps you multiply your 90 rather than taking your 100 and now it's in your hands. Go ahead. Yep. Go multiply it. Like Yeah, good luck. Yeah. You, 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 the same kind of concept. So for you, what's been the powerful way that you feel like God has helped you and your family, you and your wife Shay and, and obviously your daughters and a family together direct the family and the business? Where have you seen him? Like I'm seeing, hearing this with the vision and if people do that. Could you imagine an entrepreneur that comes in and is like, wait a second, God showed you a vision of this, but generally what they hear is, hey, here's what our vision is, this, 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 and this, mm. we're going to execute on it. People go out there and they go, bro, I want a vision like that. I'm going to I'm gonna put down a framework. Who do I want to serve? How do I want to sure. serve them? What's the one product that I come out with that solves one, that solves one problem for one niche that are all phenomenal, yet mm -hmm. the, the basis for you, the why is so much more powerful because you feel like God has shown you this. So how has God showed up in your business? Like what does running even God's business mean to you? Yeah, it's a great question. And you kind of touched on this earlier, but two, two ways, two ways it's God's business or two applications. One is, uh, and this is relates to tithing. Um, the first time I really saw God show up in, in my business w was with the concept of tithing. I, I was after my first year of going all in on this thing, which by the way, I worked full time. I made $7,000 in year one of, of an online business. So not a great start, but, um, yeah. after nice that first off. year, you got, you got some write offs. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Um, after year one, I'm sitting, it's like a January. I'm going into my second year and, uh, and I'm, I'm believing like this, this is what God's called me to do. And by the way, we're on food stamps at this point because we're not making enough. Like we literally are on food stamps. Um, and my kids are on Medicare or Medicaid, whichever one it is. Um, and uh, I'm sitting there in January. I'm like, Lord, I don't make really any money. Uh, and I've never been in a position where I, I have uh, irregular income. I don't know how this works, but I used to, I always have tithed and I want to keep tithing. How do I tithe off of this unknown income, especially when I'm at the beginning of a business and who knows what year two will look like. So I prayed and I felt like the God, like God made it really clear to me and, and just in a thought came in my mind in my prayer time, I felt like the Spirit say, I want you to tithe as if you made $60,000 in a year. It was the most random thing. It wasn't my idea, but it was very clear. And so my mind interpreting that was like, okay, um, that would be $6,000 divided by 12. That would be $500 a month uh, because to me it was important that I was giving off the first fruits and not waiting to see how much I made and then tithing. I really wanted to, to give in faith. Um, and that's the number he gave me. So I went to Shay. I was like, babe, I think this is what God told me uh, so that we're going to commit to $500 a month starting now, even though I, I was making about $500 a month. I got a little stipend from the church because they felt really bad for me and I wasn't making much in the business. And so it almost looked like we were, <laughs> it almost looked like we were tithing everything in a way. Um, but I, that was just so clear to me. I was like, let's just try it. 
long story short, um, didn't still didn't make much money. In the middle of that year, I launched a couple of new products because I'm still figuring things out, and those were those were a better hit with my audience than the previous ones. My audience was growing on YouTube and my blog, and it, it was a, it was an exponential moment in the second half of year two where things really picked up. So I didn't make much in the first half, but the second half it all came in, and we ended the year with sixty five thousand dollars. And I, I told my wife, I was like, oh my gosh, babe, because A, we used to make $30,000 each, like when we both worked full time and she's home with our baby. And now I just brought in $65,000 from home talking about music recording stuff, which was fun and nerdy for me. And more importantly is what God, God told me. He's like, tithe as if you made 60,000 and we made it. And I was like, oh my gosh, he did it. You know, yeah. and so then we said, let's do it again next year. God, what number should we give? We just asked him, what should we tithe off of? And, and he told me, tithe off of 120000 And so you can guess where this goes. We did 120 k Next year, tithe off of 250 We did 250 Next year, tithe off of 500 We did 500 I mean, I'm not telling God what to do. He was telling me what to tithe off of, and the numbers kept growing till I told a point where I got uncomfortable a little bit about like, Oh, am I, am I on the edge of like manipulating God or prosperity gospel? I didn't know. I'd never, I couldn't talk to my Christian friends about this. They were like weirded out and they're like, bro, I don't know what you're doing. But that was one thing I want everyone to know who, who follows Jesus and who has a business is that it's not your business. It's God's business. Great name for a podcast. And, and part of that is what you said of, not just God can multiply your 90% or whatever you, you give um, or keep after you give, but he deserves your loyalty and your worship. And, and money is the God that we worship in this culture, in America at least. And even if we don't want to, it has our heart. So the best way to show God and yourself to free yourself from that idol worship is to give it back to him and it helps with the heart. And then that's what he's really after. Like God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Like he has all the money. He doesn't need your money. Now he, he, he will use it and he can multiply yours, but he wants to know is your allegiance with him. And money, I think, is the one way we prove our allegiance because it hurts so much, bro. Giving now hurts even more than it did back then. Like it didn't hurt as much to give back then, but when the numbers have a lot of zeros at the end of them, you're like, oh, it hurts. So if you're not giving now, you're not going to give when you make a lot more. It's so much harder to give then. So that's a huge, huge way uh, I've followed God in my business. It's just through the financial side. Bro, and even what you said about when you were doing that, you couldn't really go to someone and be like, yo, I just set a gold tithe off a million dollars personal income. That means I'm going to tithe a hundred grand. There's so many like stigma, just a lack of understanding. And this is why there's kings and priests, right? Like the reason I created King's Brotherhood and God's business is because there's Christians that are called in their life to business. Yeah. And it takes being around people to understand what you're going through. If you're going to spend a million dollars a month on advertising, it's tough to go to your friend at the local church. You connect on faith. You love Jesus. They have, they have gifts and talents and abilities and places they're serving. Just like pastors have communities, ministries have communities, but where is there a business and, and Jesus community that overlap where we can have these conversations and it's not weird, right? We can be inspired. I remember one of my great friends, uh, Brandon Pooley, he's done 200 million. He's a partner of mine inside of King's Brotherhood, exited his company, and I've always seen him faithfully tithe. Not because he's publicly announcing it to people. We're yeah. close friends and I know that he's doing that. And man, it was so inspiring to me. Just like, man, like if I could see his personal income raised to five million a year in 2017, 18, and like him still keep tithing and grow that income after that, I'm like, this is inspiring. But where can he where 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 is the person that can relate to that? The business owner who's also experiencing the same thing. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I think it's just one of those things as well is that that man doesn't live off bread alone, but every word yeah. that comes out of the mouth of God. And that doesn't just mean word. Like reading, can, God can speak through his word and always does. It's a living word. He is the word, yeah. but he also speaks to you individually. And he spoke to you individually. And and the other thing it really brought up for me is that when Saul, when God turned his eye away from Saul in 1 Samuel like 15-ish and turned it on to David that no one knew about at the time, it was because he wasn't – he was willing to sacrifice what he needed to sacrifice, but he wasn't obedient in what God said. Mm. And a lot of people are like, God, if you – 
help me win the lottery. I promise you this time yeah. I'll tithe $8 million sure. or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, I get it. If you get that, you'll keep it. And then maybe you'll be, a, you'll, you'll sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed mm -hmm. if you're told, but you were obedient, right? This is what God yeah. says. I'm obedient yeah. in it. No matter what comes up, whether you make a lot or whether you made a little, you were willing to be obedient. It was kind of cool that it was interesting. What, what if you would have just had a bigger vision, <laughs> you know, if you're like, huh, yeah, now that's the haunting question. That's the yeah, haunting yeah. question. Yeah. But either way he's on it. And, and even, even just looking at what you're doing now, I, I had gone through some of your stuff and I was looking at the, um, recording revolution.com. That's why I was like, bro, I'm about to record with this guy that like knows everything about this stuff. Uh, and then also what you're doing with your personal bits, business mentoring and coaching. I even heard a person at the mastermind we were in someone they knew was affected because of your content. Walk me through that success trajectory so that people kind of know what you're doing now with mm -hmm. both of those style companies and anything else that you have going on as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and and w w real quick, one thing I'll say, because you've touched on it a couple of times here. I think the key, right, it's, is abiding with Jesus, spending time with him so that you can listen to him so you have a chance to be obedient to him. We're so busy. We so All our plans, like you said, like here, I'm going to make my vision for my business why don't we ask Jesus what his vision is for the business he wants us to create? Like, like Joe, you know, like, um, uh, Seth, Seth Godin says like build a downhill business, right? And just make it easy on yourself. Like the, the ultimate downhill business is the one that God's behind. Cause then, then he's doing all the heavy lifting instead of going and building what you want to build, ask God what he wants you to build. It will line up with your desires, right? If you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, but man, where he's going, it's going to be more powerful. So take time every day to listen to what he has to say. Um, that's the only way you're going to hear any insight. Then, then before you get into this next part, then break down what are the things that you have done, like a tactical thing. I look at Solomon. When you really look at Solomon, people look at him and say, well, he asked for wisdom. Yeah. Right. Understanding and ability to judge. Well, if you actually break it down, I look at it. I studied it, it in depth. I'm like, well, actually, he honored God for what he did in his father, David. Mm -hmm. he 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 also then even afterwards he came in with humility he's like a king a kid everyone's respecting him and he goes i don't know how to come in or go out mm -hmm. he's like comes in with humility and he and when god asks him he answers the question how many people like struggle mm -hmm. to even if god were to say what do you want and so there was a framework right and that mm -hmm. that framework goes on there's plenty of nuggets in there but for that. you, what's been a framework that you've used to connect with God, hear from God, to get direction in these areas that you're working on, like the company? Yeah, no, I love that. Um, what I've been doing, in, in really in the last year, this has really evolved for me. I've gotten some mentorship from a, a brilliant guy here in Tampa, Ed Coble, who uh, he runs um, Ed DeBartolo's real estate portfolio. He used to own the, the 49ers and when they won all the Super Bowls, but he does a lot of philanthropy, but he's got a big real estate arm. So this guy runs a $5 billion real estate portfolio and he, he makes all his decisions by asking God what to do. And God tells him <laughs> it's crazy. He's got crazy stories. And so he started to tell me like, Hey, here's what, here's what you need to be doing. And here's what we've started to do. It, it's like every day, it's a daily quiet time, but in that quiet time, it's a journal is open and you're treating it. I'm treating it like having a meeting with my mentor. God is the ultimate source of all knowledge and wisdom, right? So if I'm going to go have a meeting with a mentor, someone I respect, am I going to bring a notebook and a pen and write down what he says? You better believe it. So, and I never did. I was like, when I thought about it that way, it flipped for me. Like, oh my gosh, why am I getting angry at journaling and making fun of journaling? I should be journaling the most with the God of the universe. So wow. open up the journal uh, opening up God's word, right? Because God, you mentioned God's word. There's the logos and there's the rhema. So there's two words you see in scripture for the word of God. The logos is the written word, and then Jesus is the embodiment of that perfectly. And so scripture is so important. And then there's the rhema, which is the utterance of God. And that's when God can tell you something specific for your life. And that's when the spirit prompts you and tells you to pick up the phone, call that person, or do this deal, or whatever it is. And so I, I'll start with the logos. I'll start with God's written word to me. And maybe I'll have a Bible reading plan or there's a verse that God's put on my heart. Or sometimes I just pray like, what do you want me to read today, Lord? And whatever kind of pops up, you know, I will, I'll start in scripture there. And I'm, I'm letting the Holy Spirit direct me. So I'm just reading and not all of it's going to jump off the page, but there might be a verse or a chapter that jumps off the page. I just notice it a bit more. And so what Ed has 
like sort of mentored me to do and coached me to do is to pay attention when a verse jumps out a little bit more and then use a tool like Blue Letter Bible, which is free. It's an app or it's a website to to do a word study. Look at the Greek or look at the Hebrew. See if there's a, the definition of one of those words that we have translated in English really jumps out at you. And then to do cross references, and they're right there in the app as well. Like, click on it. What are the cross references? The other verses in Scripture that support this idea. Let the Bible interpret the Bible, but you, you kind of go a layer deeper, and then a cross reference of that cross reference, and a layer deeper, and just keep looking at the cross references until one of those jumps out at you, and it becomes this sort of beautiful rabbit trail where you're you're diving deeper into where the Spirit is leading you, and then there might be one moment or one verse from that little rabbit trail that you just sense, this is what God wants me to know today. And nine times out of 10, I hear from the Lord through those cross-references, and it might be a reminder to wait on the Lord. Okay, I need to wait. It might be a reminder to, uh, like last year, he took me to Isaiah 30, verse 15, multiple times, where it says, like, in in retiring and rest, you'll be saved. Like, the word, depending on your English translation, literally means, like, to withdraw from war. And I felt God was saying, like, you are still, like, trying to run after it like it's all up to you. And he's been sending me all these verses of like, you need to rest, bro. And yet I'm going to grow your business, which is sounds counterintuitive to someone like me who wants to assume if it's going to grow, it's up to me kind of thing. So God brought my attention to that verse a lot. And so I'll do the word studies, but, and then I just journal, I write down what I think, you know, what it says about God's character, what, if there's any promises in scripture there, I want to know what are the conditions to those promises because a lot of times there are. And you mentioned like obedience to certain things. What else is there? You know, Deuteronomy 28 has this beautiful passage of like you'll have all these, everything you touch will be blessed. Everything you do will be blessed. But there's a lot of conditions there. You have to obey all of God's commands that he's told you and not worship other idols. And so if you keep reading the whole chapter or the previous chapters, you'll see what else is happening here if there's some conditions. So I'm just kind of journaling through. And then finally, sometimes, bro, I treat it like a mentor in that, like, if I have a very specific question or challenge in my business or life, I'll write that down. Like, Father, like, I'm really struggling in uh, my marriage in this area. I don't know what to say to Shay about this. Or I'm struggling to know what to do about this deal. Should I take this deal or not? And I'll ask him very specific questions because I believe he could answer me if he wants to in that moment through somebody else down the road. Maybe I'll get a phone call or a text. Uh, And so I'll ask those specific questions. And final thing is I've been learning. um, I read a great book last year called Invitation to Silence and Solitude by Ruth Haley Barton. And just practicing, right, so basic, but I I don't do this well, sitting and listening for an answer. It's like setting my timer for 20 minutes and just sitting and listening to God. She says in that book that we're like a jar of river water that's all shooken up. And you have to put the jar down and let it sit for the sediment to settle so then the water can become clear so we can actually have clarity about what God wants to say. And she kind of re, re-quotes Psalm 46. So we've, we've always read it as, be still and know that I'm God. She says it like this way, be still and the knowing will come. And it just like blew me away. Like if I can just sit still for parts of my day, I can, I can maybe hear God a little more clearly. And that's, it's not really formulaic. It's just like these are all tools that might help you or help me hear from the Lord of the universe who then I'd rather take his plan and go faster than Graham's stupid bumbling through the dark plan. Bro. And and I just wrote down that whole thing. I was just taking notes on my iPhone hashtag ad. Just kidding. I wish I, I wish (laughs) (laughs) that'd be nice. Right. So uh, I just took notes on my phone though. That's what I was doing there. That framework. There's just something about just hearing that fresh framework, something that you can implement yourself and, I just think that what you're talking about is just so important looking at the fr- a, a container, right, the 20 minutes even of being still so that you can kind of let that lake water analogy – everyone's seen that, right? You walk in a lake and it gets all jacked, yep. but before you touch it, it, it smooths out. If you sit there long enough, everything kind of settles down. You can see clearly, and I think that that's a great way to put it, right? Even with prayer, it's like God's always thinking and he's always there and he's, and he's always ready to – he's not like – you know, needs to be called upon. And then he comes a lot of times I look at prayer, almost like God, help me see what you are doing and what you want to do, because I know it's right there. I know you're already way ahead of it than I am. You know, God's omnipresent. He's not, he's not just present in time. he knows the future. The devil doesn't know the future or else he would have never killed Jesus. He can't be in two places at once. And so we have this father that can be 100% present with each of us. And I, I just love that man. It's 
phenomenal, a phenomenal way that you put that all together. And it's like, I want to get to what you do. And I'm also stuck in like all these amazing things that you're talking about right now, but kind of break down for me the the success story. You guys have done some amazing things now with, with both of your companies. If you kind of break that down and I have some more stuff I want to go over with you, but oh, yeah, dude. Uh, I just, I want to make sure that I don't do that. I know that you, you wrote an awesome book and you have a couple chapters for free for, for people as well. I want to make sure I get to that. Oh yeah, man. I, um, I, I've started again back in 2009 when God told me to start this thing. Uh, it became the recording revolution, which is, uh, you know, an online business, a blog, YouTube channel, brand for musicians who want to record music on their own. I saw that I started to see the DIY recording movement um, as it was happening in the early 2000s. You know, technology was getting cheaper and uh, and more accessible. So I just got ahead of that movement and just started sharing all the secrets. I mean, and that's one sort of secret. It's not even a secret to any kind of brand online is like put out content that just is amazing. Like just share all the secrets. I, there, there's a, a, a loose phrase out there and I'm not going to name names of who says it. Cause that's not really the point, but it's like, you know, teach the what and sell the how. And I, I just don't agree with that. I think teach it all, teach the how, and you will build a raving audience that loves you and will buy anything you sell. So I was giving the how in the music space when all the gurus and the music producers would never dare think to share the how of how they made records. And interestingly enough, now that's all they want to do because there's no music money left in the industry. So they're all trying to become content creators and get paid for masterclass or all these other people. They've, they've, I've paid them. They've worked with me. Like some of my heroes in the music industry have collaborated with me just because I have an audience of hundreds of thousands of people and we could do products together because they need a way to make money. And they're like, I'll share my secrets. I'm like, I've been doing this for a decade. But um, so share it all, man. That's what I did. And God built that business to uh, a, a seven figure business. It took me a while. Um, I mean, I was just happy to be making 60 K remember, but it took me uh, about eight years on my eight year mark. I hit my first million dollar year. And the great thing about this kind of business, right. Is there's like no employees. It's like unlimited, like no, no overhead. So unlimited margins. It's, um, I don't run any ads, so it's all organic. So my costs are like nothing. And it's like, that's almost all personal income, which is crazy. Um, and in 2018, I was, I was just getting I had three years of having the itch to teach this business model to people. I had an article drop on me years ago in Business Insider, and I didn't think anybody would ever see it. Somehow it blew up um, in, for a while because the people were fascinated about how I was doing you know, $80,000, $100,000 months talking about music recording. They're like, that's so random. Um, how are you doing that? And so I got basically into coaching. I was coaching people for free. You know, people who had gyms that wanted to turn them online, people who taught French that wanted to go online. I was just like happy to talk about this business model that had set my family free. So I started doing that for years for free for people to help them out. And I was like, I love this stuff, man. I got to I want to build another resource like I did with the first business, but for this business model to make it clear for people so they don't get confused by all the, the, the goofy gurus out there. So I but I was afraid to do a second business, though. It's so funny how the imposter syndrome comes back. And I was like, but who am I to jump into the business space? This is a much bigger pond and I'm a much smaller fish and I'm comfortable over here. And I was the, the largest YouTube channel in my niche. And I just, why bet you just stay there? But I punted for almost, almost three years, two and a half years of, on, before I launched. Cause I was just afraid of not being good enough or not being credible enough or whatever. So I finally launched that personal brand in 2018, GrahamCochran.com as like a, a side project. But then God, again, I don't, so I'm, start, I'm stopping to make plans because God has better plans. He, he turned that into my main thing. Like he, he put his hand on it and it grew to a seven figure business really quick. Like in less than three years, quick for me, less than three years. Um, and I was like, this is so much more fun. And so I, I, I don't love the music side anymore, which was a big identity shift for me too. Cause I was always the music guy, but long story short, I, God gave me a way to hand that off, um, to a partner who functions, functions as a partner to run it, get other content creators. I still own it to this day, but I haven't been in the day to day of that business for two years. And, um, I've just been all in on my personal brand and, uh, we'll, we'll probably do 2 million this year, if not two and a half million this year. Um, I wrote a book. Uh, this was always a bucket list, but partly just for fun because I really wanted to, and I want to get into writing books and speaking because I feel like that's the vision God's given me. But I wanted to write this business model in a book. How to get paid for what you know is basically everything you need to know to monetize your 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 thoughts and your your knowledge. And that's just been a wild ride. So yeah, that's that's what I've been doing the last five years straight. 
is really building out that personal brand and, and seeing, being surprised that this is still needed in such a large and saturated niche. But to your point, there's not a lot of believers talking about this. And I felt like God made it really clear to me last summer on a trip in Puerto Rico and my family, he, he was clear about two things, but one of them was your job, Graham, is to reveal the kingdom. And so I have been called in the, in the immediate future to a secular audience. I've always had a secular audience, but my job has always been. And so I'm just getting affirmation to continue to reveal God's kingdom to a world that doesn't know it because God's kingdom is different. It's better. It, it smells better. It smells more refreshing. It and it's appealing to people. They just don't know what it is yet. So I'm going to try to continue to do that in the business space. So good, dude. And and for anyone out there that's searching for anything, like I'm out here in Austin, people are charging crystals under the moon. They're looking at <laughs> tides and yep. they're looking at astrology. They're looking at all these things that that actually there's 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 so many biblical ways. The, the devil can only pervert things, right? Like there's such a, a great book, actually. I forget the name of it right now, but one of my mentors was talking about how the the, the stars used to to, uh, to reveal biblical prophecies that you could read about. And it's like mm. – but it's been distorted in all these ways. But what I look at that as – and this is what it was for my life. I come from like a heavy demonic background, wow. and it's like all we are is just hungry for something bigger than ourselves. So there's so many people out there that are so hungry for something bigger than themselves, yet Christianity has not been the place that has shown them power. This is why the scripture over my entire King's Brother community is 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Wow. If there is not power coming out of the Christian's life, if there's not power on their words, their actions, the way they're living, then they're just not living the gospel 100%. Mm. This is how the disciples walked. This is why you look at the Acts Church. They walked in in power, and people will be – they'll be attracted to what you're doing, right? They're attracted to what you're doing, even with Deuteronomy 8.18 that, that remember the Lord your God for he, it is he that gives you the ability to produce wealth. Yeah. And, and it's really around that place again is that in that in that specifically, the power was the power to produce wealth was – at that time, for that specific instance, a way to show, hey, this is the power of God on their life. Mm -hmm. This is revealing God through them. Not saying that every person that's that's rich is representing that, sure. but, but not always saying that it's not always the case either. That there are that times where that so happens. Good. And I just think it's awesome what you're doing. And you had talked about your book. I have it right in front of me right now, which is how to get paid for what you know. And you, you even look at that concept. You really displayed it, not even in a industry that's as easy, right? You're not like... How to affiliate market online, how to sure. – how I made X amount of dollars selling this thing, a, a niche thing. You're talking about music. <laughs> like mm -hmm. You took, turned your expertise into an online income, and even going back to, to King Solomon, it's like that was one of his business models that was so interesting and controversial because wisdom was a gift from God to Solomon. Mm -hmm. And then the very wisdom that God gave Solomon – People from all surrounding nations would pay him annually to just sit at his feet and listen to his wisdom. Mm. Talk about like twisting up any type of religion is like he literally had people coming, giving gifts of anything that they had. His personal income was over a billion dollars a year. Yeah. So that's quite a bit of reoccurring monthly memberships. Yeah. He's at crushing the, time. the membership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of like weight in gold. You know, no one's yep. just like PayPaling you at that time. And, and spreading from word of mouth from the wisdom, a gift from God. But every single one of us, this is the other side of it. Every one of us have gifts, mm -hmm. and they're all gifts from God. Even mm -hmm. if you're even if you're running a business, that gift is a gift from God. So no matter what it is, you're monetizing a gift from God. Mm -hmm. But he's not upset about it. He ha he he literally took the wisest man in the world and had him as one of his business structures was doing the same thing. And the best thing that you're doing, man, and why people should go grab this book and why they're going to want to, uh, which they can go to your website, which we had talked about, uh, was just your name.com, uh, GrahamCochran.com, and they can go check out that book, and they can grab the first chapters for free. And then once they get left on a cliffhanger from the first few chapters, go buy the freaking book because books take so much effort to build, and they're like the cheapest thing mm. to invest in for yeah. education. Uh, I just love the fact that you're giving something better in return. Money is not valuable by itself. If I were to take give you a billion U.S. dollars and tomorrow we don't use U.S. dollars anymore, right. you wouldn't care. You'd use them to light the fire. So it's really just the store of what you think it can do. Who can it impact? Who can it retire? Who can it help out? How can it shift your life? How can you invest in your relationship? 
So that's why I believe in what you're doing. So people, go get the freaking book. Love what you're doing, first off. I, w- I want to go back to when you and your wife – uh, I just think it's very interesting just hearing how biblical your guys' life is and how much you live off of that that word of God. And and again, not to diminish even the tactical side, right? Like your book is tactical. Mm-hmm. You can't go to, to Galatians and figure out how to run a Facebook ad. Sure. Like God uses people so much. Uh, so inside of your journey, how have the key structures of – mentors were in a mastermind together how have masterminds what have been the key things that have helped you accelerate your business growth i know hearing the whisper of god and then god uses his people right we are always meant to do this thing together with interdependence how has god used those structures to benefit you mentors masterminds coaches what's been the big thing that's helped you yeah man it's like um you know we're, there's nobody that's self-made you know and we know that as believers because everything we have comes from God. Every good gift comes from the Father, right? James talks about. But even even secular people, even atheists who have had any level of success understand that they've needed other people to, to help them get where they are. Um, and so you know, not to discount any hard work any of us are doing, but that's like a given at this point. You know, We understand we've got to apply ourselves. But anytime I've needed to learn something, I've tried to find people or resources if i can't connect with those people their book or their course or their community or whatever who's doing that well and my aim is really simple right it's just like pay to to join their thing or buy their book i mean i've gotten a lot out of books like this to, to your point about books there's a lot of mileage do not discount a 20 dollar book i'll read a book and if if you apply the heck out of that book it's it's not the people who know the most it's the people who apply what they the little they do know the most that win. And so I'm good at that. I'm good at applying things that I learn, but I would go find out so for example if I needed to learn about um you know recurring revenue I'd find someone who's doing that and join their course and and see how they teach it. Um and I don't need to agree with everything they're doing or even apply everything that they teach, but I'm always looking for what's the one thing I need to get out of this that will help me move my business forward. Um the book, I I didn't know anything about writing a book. And that was like a bucket list thing. And my wife was like, eventually she brought it back up. She's like, you need to do this. You said you want to do this. And I've just been, you know, I don't know. I don't want to do it. Uh, Cause I was afraid. I was afraid it wouldn't be good or no one would hear about it. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. So it's like, okay, who do I know that's written a book? Uh, and I got a, a buddy here in Tampa, Jordan Rayner, who's written a phenomenal book that I think all your people should read if they haven't already called call to create. Cause he helps Christians um, find the intersection between faith and work and his heart is entrepreneurs. So that book is all about how God's the ultimate original entrepreneur. Cause the first thing he does is create something. He risks to create something for the benefit of somebody else. And that's how he defines an entrepreneur. So it's a great book called to create Jordan Rayner, but he's written a bunch of best-selling books. I was like, bro, I, you're busy. I'm not trying to get anything from you, but can I get one call with you where you could just point me in the right direction of whether I should even go traditional publishing or self-publishing and just wind me up so I can get started on the journey, you know, but he was just super generous and was like, bro, let me coach you through this process. And so that was, I was like fortunate to know somebody. He helped me think through writing the proposal and getting an agent and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes it's a book. Sometimes it's been a course. And then, you know, connecting with you, Nicholas, I'm excited about this because I'm brand new to this group, the Wellspring. I've jumped into masterminds and groups, but none of them were the right fit for me. Like I've, a couple of them have been, have been Christian but they just, these people had no vision for their business. They weren't worried about growth. They, it was just like, it was, it was just not the right scene for me. And then I've been in masterminds where they're non-Christians and all that matters is just hustling and working harder and making more money. And I was like, I don't, I don't care. I have enough money. I want to have a healthy marriage. I want to raise my daughters. Well, I want to be plugged into my church, but I also want accountability and, and challenging to think about how to grow my business, how to give my wealth away, how to build wealth in a biblical way. I need, I need, you know, I didn't have any of that. So this group, the Wellspring is brand new to me and my wife, but I prayed for this group for a long, long time. So like my world's being flipped upside down in the last couple of months already. Um, and I, so I, I'm at the beginning of that journey. So, you know, to check back with me in 12 months and I have a feeling God's going to have done a lot because of the other people. Cause here's my final thing about it is I know that like I can't go any further unless God opens my mind and opens my eyes. And I, I only can think the way I can think. And being around people like you and other people in the Wellspring 
who are doing things differently than me or have experienced things differently or ask a question that's very provocative that makes me go, well, I never thought to think about that. It unlocks things in my mind that I wouldn't if I stayed siloed and I need to have my mind unlocked. And it's grateful. I'm grateful to have a wife. She's a business owner, super successful. We're like our own mini mastermind. But even then, we're still limited by our experience in our home and in our, our circle. And so we both need to be challenged. So I can't speak highly enough about letting other people, like having, you said, humility. Solomon had humility. Humility mm-hmm. is the key that unlocks every door. Like have a beginner's mind Again. and just say, teach me what I don't know. Ask me a question that I, I should, you should be, I should be thinking and let, and let God use those people to grow you, evolve you, and do the work in you that he wants to do. But one year in for a treat, Masterminds has been the number one most impactful thing that has created my personal growth and business growth. Their business will never outpace you. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's really unplanted me and, and given me a bigger pot to grow in has been Masterminds since 2015. Hands down the easiest because there's a lot of great info out there. But the info is only as good as the ability to apply it and put it into a system that can be used. Yet it's the sometimes the transformation internally where you don't really know what's going on. You have all this influence around you, and they're just chipping away at at your standard of life and the way you start living and thinking and breathing. And everything changes, and you just start adapting to the environment that you're in, which would be the best way to put it. You just start adapting. Love that. And you're like, I'm in this crazy environment. I'm adapting. And I'm somehow just like going to this next level subconsciously while I'm also learning consciously. We just did a great exercise today where, you know, I'm teaching people how to get booked on podcasts, like a very logical thing that's going to help them out a lot and make them a lot of money and all these things and get their message out. But at the end of the day, it's that osmosis of being in that environment that just pushes you to the next level. There's two things you said as well. Paul talks about follow me as I follow Christ. Mm-hmm. So important. Like he's not saying, hey, now that you know the Holy Spirit, and you know Jesus, like – Go sit in a corner by yourself, and he's going to answer all your problems, do everything for you, build everything for you. I love the quote that God gives you a tree, but he doesn't give you chairs. Mm. So it's like they'll give you the tree, but like he he wants you to co-labor with him and craft the chair, right? The creative ability mm-hmm. to be able to do something with what he's put in your hands. Second thing is Solomon. He, he, the wisest guy in the world didn't know how to work with bronze. He's like, I need bronze for the temple. Find me the yeah. best bronze worker. Mm-hmm. He didn't say, hold on, let me go ask for that now. Lord, Mm. make me the best bronze worker. No, like even being the wisest guy, he didn't have the tactic, and he went and found the guy that knew the tactic. Now, going back to your wife, you brought her up a few times. I think this is very relevant because it hits me as well. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without my wife. She believed in me when I didn't. She was the closest one to me and always believed in me, pushed me. It sounds like that was similar. Walk me through those instances. You've given us a few where your wife has really pushed you to go to that next level. Where does that come from or how can how can people set up their relationship and their family in a dynamic where it propels them rather than pulling them down like an anchor? Yeah, I mean, you both have to be following after Jesus. Um, and if one of you isn't, then you just you get on your knees and you pray that the Holy Spirit will convict that person and bring him or her on, right? You know, in this case, that, that, have on. you guys ever gone through something like that? Have you guys always been like both? We've always been diligent. following after Jesus. Cool. So we're we're really fortunate in that regard. We've been married married 17 years. Uh, wow. together 20 they dated for three years so for the last 20 years i mean we've both been pursuing jesus um awesome. which is huge right so that's number one um number two is i don't think my wife would have supported me in pursuing blogging and starting this online thing where i was literally just fi- figuring it out um if she didn't trust me and trust that i was walking with the lord um it's really hard to follow someone blindly if their character or their past has proven that they're untrustworthy, even if you like them and love them, they're going to panic. And the, you know, our wives are going to want to protect themselves. If they have children, they're going to want to protect their children. Um, and from a place of, I mean, it makes sense. It's not even selfish. It's just like, they're afraid. Like, I don't think this is safe. I don't feel safe. So the most important thing, like I know, yeah, you're, you're asking a great question. Men want their wives to support them, but <laughs> You have to give them a reason, and, 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 and you have to give them a reason by showing them that you are pursuing Jesus and that you have the humility to listen to what Jesus says, to what other men who are Christians say, and to listen to your wife. when Because the Spirit of God will speak to you through your wife. He's got two chances of reaching you. He's got you and your wife. So 
you have to have the humility. If you can display to your wife that you're following Jesus, you're in Christian community, um, and you're willing to listen to her if she has a concern or even just an idea, your wife doesn't have to know anything about business or your business to get an, a download from the Holy Spirit for you. Uh, and so I would practical example is there was a guy I almost went into business with to open up a recording studio in this town we were in. Went to our church. We loved him and his wife, friends of ours. And it seemed like a way to combine our finances and we were going after the same clients. It made sense, to, you know, our efforts. And I told my wife, I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing with Rob. And she said, I don't have a good feeling about that. And I was like, what's your problem? Like, what do you mean? What did he ever do? Rob's awesome. And she said, no, nothing against Rob. I just, I just have a weird vibe that you're not supposed to do this. And it, I remember like feeling it like a little defensive, but I took her advice and, and told Rob it wasn't a good fit. And she was absolutely right. Like he, he wasn't the, he's a great dude, but it wasn't the right fit for us. And his business kind of tanked and God had other plans. And so I've learned, even if it doesn't feel good, my, the Holy Spirit can give my wife a feeling, a vibe about something being off or someone being off. So if you, all that to say, if you can show her that you're pursuing Jesus, Christian community, and you have the humility to listen to Jesus, other Christians, and your wife, then I think she, she can trust you if you're uncertain about something, but you have a feeling this is something I feel God's calling me to. If she doesn't see it any further than you do, she can at least trust that if it's not going to work, my husband has a humility to like admit that, and we can navigate this together. I think that helped my case uh, because we had at least three, four years of marriage for her to see some of that budding in our relationship before God called me into this craziness. Yeah, and I think the way you guys set it up, she was able to see the greatness and potential in you almost through the eyes of Jesus and you the opposite. Being able to do that. I remember my wife one time, we were in a terrible place. I was literally like paying off $100 of credit card debt every single month, working full-time. She was working part-time, and she wanted to make this really, really big investment into our education. And I remember just like I just knew that she would never do anything to hurt our family. And like I, I just had to get behind her. I knew I'd already be doing the wrong thing if I didn't. And it was there was this place of like we both saw God's – through our eyes, like God had given us a vision of – of which each person was meant to become. And we're able to like build each other up. But you hear a lot in marriage that it's kind of like, you know, I, I work with men, right? So one of the first things is that the guys are no longer trustworthy. So the women are afraid of their husband making a decision because they didn't do a good job last time, right? Maybe they invested in a real estate property, which wouldn't be with me. That's not my expertise, but maybe they did and they failed. So now they're trying to look at the next thing and it's carrying on. There's distrust that's being mm. created. But what you guys have created is this amazing form of trust and also just this bond where you've continued to not allow your eyes to drift away and think about all the negative because you can right you could look at anyone and try to find all the negative yeah but you guys have not done that i think that there's something very special within that that is just super impressive mm. oh i appreciate that. i received that man and i will say my wife and i couldn't be more different um and we frustrate each other in, the, in our, the, our personalities, the way we think about things. Um, I mean, that probably makes a good mastermind, right? When you have people that think differently than you, but it's frustrating when you live with that person, you know, why can't you see it the way I see it? And so it's not without its challenges in that, like, we're not always like, you know, for example, uh, I'm half glass, half full. She's glass, half empty. So we go in, like, we were looking for a new church last year when God called us out of our church. We go visit churches, which is the most awkward thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get in the car with the kids. And you're like, all right, what everybody think? I would start to list all the, the things I liked about it. And she would start with all the things she hated about it. And I'm like, why are you just dogging on all these churches? Come to find out, like, it's, we have the same number of likes and dislikes, but I just lead with the positive. She leads with the negative. And we had to, we had to unpack a lot of stuff where she felt like I was, like, attacking her all the time. Like, why, why can't you be positive? She's like, I am positive, but I don't, why can't you see the negatives? I'm scared that you're not seeing the things that are questionable. And I'm like, well, I see them, but I just don't lead with them. So that's, that's marriage, right? But at the core... Like if you strip all that away, we've got two decades of, of doing life together and doing go th going through some scary things. Like you, it sounds like you guys have, you and Amanda have that. It's it's scary and hard, but man, do I trust her a hundred percent? Does she trust me a hundred percent? And I so think good. that's what we have. Everything else is up for debate. Like, do we always like what each other do? Would we do? Do I wish she was different in some regards? Does she wish I was different in other ways? Yes. But man, if you ask us about the trust question. No doubt. And that doesn't mean I haven't made mistakes and she hasn't made mistakes. 
Yep. But th- that's why trust is so worth it because even if there are some mistakes that are made, we can assess them and be like, okay, well, we, sometimes we just don't know. We are taking steps of faith, but that doesn't define you. So it's an ongoing process, but it's worth fighting for, man. And I wouldn't want to have a business without my wife because I just sense that most of my best decisions came from at least checking with her and like reading her face and her vibe. Cause she, again, she's super dialed in with the spirit and hopefully I'm the same way for her. So good. And you had talked about earlier, just about godly counsel. And I just, I think this is so important. Even just looking at, you talked about different personalities with your wife and that's, that's how it's kind of supposed to be even with feminine and, and masculine, right? Mm-hmm. God created man and took woman out of man. And oftentimes people think like men should be either very feminine or, or women could, should be masculine. And really he ripped these two things together and put them apart and put them back together. And you guys have this different experience, right? This is why I run a men's community is because I'm like, yeah, there's a big difference between men and women outside yep. of just personality, right? Calling and role and just the way that we pers- act and, you know, men want respect and, and women want to feel loved and safe and so many different aspects of that that make it even more complicated because yep. it's not just personality. It's also we're com- completely built differently yeah. and complementary together, just like your personalities. It's actually more common than not. That's the majority of people, like 90% of people marry the same way complete polar opposite because it's inside of that that you guys are literally fitting like a puzzle piece mm. it's just celebrating the differences and the strengths and not uh, obviously there's also the pros and cons of each one of ours your your optimism can also make you fall short on due diligence sure her glass half empty could make her not look at the positive yeah. so there's always this great balance to it but it's also comes with such a immense strength that you guys have together for you with the godly counsel how is being around other Christian men, how have you utilized that as a council? There's not many places nowadays where guys are actually doing things together. Now, a lot of the work can be that can be done in the world can be done very co-ed. You're doing stuff online. It can be. It's not taking strength, or mm. we're not going to war together to conquer something. We're not having someone attack a kingdom. And if that were to happen, you and I would be locking arms, and and the wives would be home. Yeah. Not because they can't fight, because we wouldn't let them fight. Yeah. Like, Hey, you ain't going to the front door. If there's someone breaking into my house, yeah. even if my wife knows how to use a gun better than me, like I'm going with the gun first. Yeah. Ain't going to happen. I ain't sending her to the front door to go check. And so for you, how have you utilized like godly male relationships to, to sharpen your life? Yeah. I mean, for me, it started in my church, um, going to small groups and, and just committing to like not only being in church on Sunday, but and being under the teaching of God's word and being with God's people to worship. But getting into a small group and being known by a group of guys, you know, 10 or less, like I need to be known. They need to know who I am, what my struggles are. And I want to know other guys too. And and dealing with all the awkwardness that comes with that, right? Like we're all going to have different backgrounds, different personalities. I'm not going to like every guy in the group, but like forcing myself to be a part of men's small groups has been huge. Um, and being, being honest and being vulnerable. Um, you, you can be in all the small groups. You can be in, guys can be in your community and still not shared honestly and truthfully. Um, it's very easy for us to be compartmentalized in our minds, uh, about things. So I can be very open about my business in a men's group, um, but not disclose uh, an addiction to pornography or, uh, a, a relationship with another woman that's starting on a text thread. That's, you know, not quite anything physical yet, but it could be like, there's ways we could easily compartmentalize those parts, right? If we didn't want to disclose that or think it's not, relevant. Like these guys want to talk business and maybe in a secular group, that's, that's true. They don't care. <laughs> they really probably, cause they probably don't think it's that big of a deal, but man, being in a group of men who are Christians, um, is huge. And then being willing to like, Hey, here's, here's all my mess. Um, and maybe you don't do that on the first meeting. Maybe you got to get to know these guys a bit and trust them, but you need to find a group where you can do that. And if it's not a small group at your church, for me, sometimes it hasn't always been Um, it's been like, get two to three other guys that I know love Jesus. And it's like, Hey, can we jump on a zoom call once a week? Um, can we text? Um, I I just need someone that I can share this stuff with that I know won't judge me who who loves Jesus, but who also won't let me just become a a douchebag, you know, who, who really has a high value of integrity and wants the best for me. Um, so that's, that's evolved. I, I think I was naive to think once I found that group, the perfect group, it would always stay the same. 
Um, and I feel like that's let me down. I've realized, okay, I just need to be a little bit more open-minded to God's going to shift me to different groups sometimes for a season um, for a lot of reasons. It's mutual. Maybe he wants me in that group to speak into somebody, and maybe there's someone that needs to speak into my life. And so in the last year, that's changed dramatically as we left our church that God called us to, and that was very hard um, being brand new, not knowing anybody, and you know, but finding some people that I can start to open up to again. And then, man, dude, Wellspring... <laughs> In Phoenix in January, that just that whole weekend was like insane. Uh, I didn't know anybody in that group, and then just the the move of the Holy Spirit, just the vulnerability from everybody. Um, you just can't replace that. So I don't really care where it comes from, as long as these people love Jesus um, and love you and your marriage and your family and want to fight for that as much as you do. You just got to do it with at least one or two other guys. I appreciate you sharing that, and thank you for sharing about the stuff with the churches. Many of the guys come here, they they encounter our community because it's not it's not the church, yeah. and I truly believe in finding that that local place. I've done both. Believe me, I, I'm not people's pastor. I've had times where I'm like, oh, churches, walls, and and that's not what the church is. And I get a stream from online, or I'm traveling a ton. I'm building something. I'm going to just go check ones out, and you never really get plugged in. And I just can't find the benefit anymore. The benefit of not being plugged in is that you have a chance to not get offended. Mm -hmm. That's real. Or be in an uncomfortable circumstance. That's the benefit. The downside is so much blessing, breakthrough, community, teaching, cons consistently being in front of just fresh teaching, so many benefits. And, and going to church again, the only downside is that there's an opportunity that people can mess up. But people ain't your God. Nope. Church ain't your God. Right. A lot of people, they, they know, they know, they don't know Jesus. They know church. <laughs> they yeah. know the pastor. They know their friends. Like those are just people, right? This is why Gandhi talked about, it. he's like, Oh, I love Jesus, but I just don't really like the people that follow him. Yeah. It's like, yeah that's that's like, real. That's a good word. And Hey, I'll, I feel like the spirit told me to say this too, is if you have kids, you got to get your family to church. And here's why so good. they need to see other men and women who love Jesus that aren't you. Yep. Right. Like th there are seasons and situations for sure where you can't make it to a church or certain missionaries. I mean, there is no church. You're like, you're doing, I totally get that. But if you have the ability to get to a church on Sunday, and if you have kids get to church on Sunday, because that you don't understand the influence of them seeing other people worship, raising their hands, seeing the pastor preach, just being influenced by other adults who love Jesus. So, so important youth group or not. It's so valuable. And you want God to bring those other adults into to their life who are, are in the local church community. Yeah, I'm seeing my son. He he raises his hand, especially when he goes towards the, like he'll try to go up the stairs to get on stage. Heck yeah. And the, the closer he gets, because he sees all the worship leaders, right, raising yeah. their hands. So the closer he gets, his hands are in the air. Just turn three. And I'm just That's like, awesome. man, this is so epic, man. Like, That's awesome. stretch your hands out and pray for these people. And my son's like three, and he's like, wow, putting out his hands. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. And That's a lot powerful. of, yeah, I just, I, I just think exactly what you're saying. And, and to wrap us up, man, one of the things I think – I talk about the power of God, and I know everyone's had different experiences. So whether it's seemingly insignificant, right? we didn't pre-plan this. We didn't pre-plan any of this. Whether it's seemingly insignificant or very significant, where have you experienced just the tangible power of God in your life? Maybe it was when you first met him. Maybe it was through some type of experience. Maybe it was something very small but it was profound to you, just like – those words that you're talking about from the blue letter Bible where he speaks to you and man, there's nothing more purposeful. You can make a billion dollars like all these people do and they are hundreds of millions from the lottery and they feel purposeless loss and they end up broke again in five years on average and because it just has no purpose. It has no, the will of God isn't in it. You're not, you're not eating the word of God. You're not communing with, with the creator of the universe who created you and you're not on the path that he has for you. And there's just something so special about that. So for you, what's something that comes to mind with you encountering the tad, tangible power of Jesus inside of your life? I'd love to hear it to wrap us up. Yeah, man. Can I share a quick story to answer that question? Oh, bro. Like I'm talking, I'm talking like I'm getting fed right now. So bring it. Oh man. Well, just this may maybe, you know, I wish I had crazy cool stories of like miraculous healing and, and things like that. My, my church background just never experienced that. So hey, that's hey, more, to me. the more we hang out, like we'll get you covered on that side. Good, great, great, great. I'm ready for it. Bring on the crazy. Um, oh yeah. But, uh, last summer 
um, I, I, we took the month of July off from work. And then part of that was I took the family to Puerto Rico for three weeks just to, to unwind and spend a lot of time trying to pray and read my Bible and sit and listen. And, um, God did something really crazy in my, in my world in Puerto Rico on that trip. This is last July. I'm in Puerto Rico and there's a, a, a loose acquaintance of mine. I've been on his podcast. He's a really big podcast. Um, and he lives in Port, lives in Puerto Rico. And I just hit him up. I said, Hey man, um, you know, I, I'm in, I'm in town. Like it, what should we be doing in Puerto Rico? What's fun? Like I got two kids. What should we do? I was just looking for recommendations because I know, I know he lives there and he talks about it. And so, um, he was giving me some recommendations and then he kind of, you know, he said, Hey man, well, you know, if you come over to this side of the Island, like come stop by the house, like bring the kids by, they can swim in the pool. And I was like, Oh, that's awesome, man. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to like bother you. I don't know you like that, but if, you know, sure. If we make it over there, that'd be awesome. I'd love to, to see you in person and, and, and check out your sweet house. That's what I was thinking. So we, we, we go over there one day. Um, and I walk in, I walk around to the back of his house and, and it's beautiful. He's on this mountain and in this gorgeous home and beautiful outdoor pool area. And he can see down the mountain, see the ocean. It's, it's awesome. But I just, I felt really weird. It's one of those feelings. Like it just, something felt off. And it was so off to me that when I sat down, my, the kids started swimming and it's me and Shay and then, and him, we're starting to talk. You know, I, I prepped my wife. I was like, Hey, I know you don't know him, but this is what he does. I was on, I was on his podcast and you know, really nice guy. Let's, you know, I don't know if he's a Christian, so maybe God wanted us to connect to share the gospel. Let's just get to know him and, and see what's up. We sit down and so I know him, my wife doesn't, but I can't, I can't bring myself to talk like something like shutting me up. I just feel so off and it's awkward. Like Shay's like, okay, well, I guess I'll talk to this random dude. So she's asking him all the basic questions, you know, where's your wife? What are you up to? And oh, she's traveling and talking about your business. So we're just talking and I just feel off long story short. We have this awkward conversation out there. Maybe he thought it wasn't awkward and my wife just picked up the slack like a champ, but I just couldn't, I couldn't dive in for some reason. And then at the end, he's like, Hey, you know, you want a tour of the house? And I'm thinking, I don't actually want a tour of the house. Like I don't, I don't care. Um, so what we did to be polite, he's showing off all his stuff and, um, showing where he does his podcast and all this kind of stuff and how awesome, how awesome his life was, you know? And he kept saying, bro, you, you know, you should move here, man. Like the tax rates, like you don't pay anything in taxes. And like, you could live in this neighborhood. Like you could have a house just like me. Like, look at this view. Like this could be your view, bro. This is awesome. And, uh, and we drive home that night and I'm still silent. And my wife's like, babe, what is up with you? Why were you so weird? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like I'm kind of just like weirded out and wrecked inside. And I don't know why next day sitting out, out, out the, the back of the Airbnb of the pool and I'm just trying to process what happened last night. I feel stupid. I feel embarrassed. I, did he think I'm a weirdo? My wife's confused. And I'm talking about it with her. And then I'm praying about it. And then I feel like the Lord said, like, while I'm just sitting there in silence. He's like, bro, I just showed you what you want. Part of you wants everything he has. You want to be able to keep more of your money and pay like hardly anything in taxes you want to have a house like his. You want to live on, on the hill like his. Like These are all things I want. His lifestyle, like he has no kids. He can do whatever he wants. He was about to take like a three-week, you know, Viking River cruise in Europe with some friends. And like, that's literally like on my bucket list. And, and be, But you, you can't do that because you have to pull your kids out of school. And I showed you, like, it literally felt like him saying, like when Satan took Jesus to the top and showed him all the kingdoms, this could all be yours. Sorry, my wife, my, my daughter's calling me. This could all be yours. And, uh, and it, it clicked me. It's like, oh my gosh, I felt like not that I was tempted, but I was shown everything that I wanted, but everything that he was showing me was about his self-resilience, how he, he, he was like protected from the hurricanes that came, like his house could run on its own power. He has food for a year. Like he doesn't need anybody or anything. And part of that is all stuff I wanted. And then Jesus was like, in this vision, he's like, bro, I didn't call you to self-resilience or reliance or having everything covered on your own. I caused you to be a giver. That's what I called you to be. And not only do I not really necessarily want you to have all those things, not in a bad way, but I wanted you to get real close to it so you could see that it, did, like, it didn't satisfy him. Like he wasn't satisfied with it. My wife asked all these probing questions. Like, well, what's your purpose now that, and he's like, I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. I felt God say, bro, I showed you gently everything you thought you wanted and showing that it's not even going to satisfy. And so instead, let's go over here and let's focus on building my kingdom and not your own kingdom. And let's do it by giving even more radically. Like generosity is a huge part of our story 
as I shared a little bit with the tithing. And so God called us to just radically increase our giving in a way that's made me still feel very uncomfortable, but I feel very cared for and it was very tender because he got me real close to what I thought I wanted and showed me, it's not even what you want, bro. I'm going to show you a better way. And he gave me this vision and this I'll end it here. I don't get visions very often, but it was very clear today as day where Jesus is on a beach, which is like my happy place. And he's handing me presents that they're wrapped like Christmas presents with a bow. He's handing them to me and he's saying, Hey, I want you to distribute these out to people. And as long as you keep distributing these presents, the flow will never stop. That's like literally what he told me. I was like, all right, let's go. I haven't had anything like that since, but it happened there and it really altered kind of what our generosity piece looks like. And, just the tenderness of God and showing me all of that was just powerful. Powerful is bright. What a phenomenal way to end it. If you could, I would love for you to actually quickly pray for, in those two things that you guys have had ridiculous favor inside of your giving, a motivation for giving obedience and the blessing that comes with it, and just the obedience part. Uh, if you could just release that over our audience, man, that'd be amazing. Yeah, man, let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, um, for your Holy Spirit who's here with us, who's been left on earth with us to empower us, to teach us, to, um, to, to remind us of everything Jesus taught us. Just thank you for your kindness. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance, the scripture says. Thank you for your patience with us. And God, I pray over these men that you would give them the freedom that they would feel the, the release. If, if anyone is listening to this, who's holding on too tightly to the resources you put in their hand, help them to truly take you at your word. When you say that if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. And if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. God, you love a cheerful giver. It's hard. It's hard to help release these men to give more beyond what feels comfortable, not to prove that they are better than anybody else, but to release the power that mammon and money have on us and show you, God, that our allegiance is to you and also to put more of these seeds in the ground that they may multiply and we would reap a bigger harvest and your kingdom would be affected for change and we would have more resources with which to use, God. You're looking for faithful stewards, people who are managing your resources well. Would you find us faithful that we would give more? And maybe more importantly than that, Lord, may we ask you what you want us to give. May we ask, take the time to listen and have the courage to obey instant obedience, not delayed obedience, but instant obedience to whatever you say, trusting that you are a good God, a, a sweet, kind dad who knows what's best for us, who will empower us to do everything you call us to do and will resource us in every way that we need to be resourced Would you work on us in our obedience, our generosity, our open hands? May we have open hands to give and receive from you in that pattern, that cyclical pattern, as long as we live. And would you bless everything that these men touch for your glory and their benefit? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you so much again for coming on the God's Business Podcast. This is really, that that release is really the whole purpose of this. Some things are better caught than taught. People learned a lot of things here, but that transformation of us masterminding together with a third person in the room, that the main reason for this being Jesus and the breakthrough inside of men all across the world, inside of the business realm, being empowered and equipped to take their mission out on the earth. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. This was great.